603, I'd like to kind of get going. I know you don't want to take too much of people's time and so forth, like your time, particularly the gym. So we're going to jump right in. Uh, I record this. And so um, if others want to see, and in fact, invited some people from Environment and Climate Change Canada. I don't know if they showed up. Hopefully they may jump on, they may not. If not, they'll see it later. Um, <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Jim mctaggart Kellen, one of my mentors and former professors. So this is, uh, I was thinking to myself, or actually I had a, I've just started a new course, teaching a new course today, uh, the, the undergrad course. And I said, you gotta come out to this. I said, because Jim is one of my former profs from Royal Roads. And uh, so this is gonna be like, like Luke Skywalker uh, interviewing Ben Kenobi in a Star Wars context. <laughs> no, but uh, so Jim was one of my professors at Royal Roads and uh, taught me, I was doing a, a sustainable development series, which was actually kind of similar to this in the sense it was comprehensive, uh, but atmospheric science, meteorology, pollution prevention, ethics. Uh, what else did you teach there? Oh, statistics. Statistics. Yeah, a variety of different things. They gave you everything. Meteor Global climate change. I, yeah, I did an awful lot of things. <laughs> yeah. So we even had theodolites. Like, I don't know many yeah. places. What university in Canada? Like, he, I guess the Met like the, the service, the, the university programs where you, you're teaching meteorology, hopefully they, they teach them how to use a theodolite. I'm not sure. I suspect most of them don't. <laughs> no, we literally had a theodolite, like old school. That was great. And that's, that's how you learn old school. Like you go and watch things and see the, the atmospheric processes playing out in front of you. So um, uh, Jim is a, uh, as atmospheric scientist by training, uh, uh, atmospheric physics, atmospheric sciences, PhD from University of Toronto, uh, Master of Science uh, in Atmospheric Sciences and Bachelor of Science in Atmospheric Sciences. So you have been drawn to the atmosphere for quite some time. And I'm curious about that. I'm gonna ask you about that. But first, uh, in terms of your background, so you ended your career uh, in terms of uh, environmental practice as a professor at, at Royal Roads University. But previous to that, um, you were working uh, in the regulatory context, which is very interesting to me because I, well, I didn't know you had worked at both the provincial and federal level. I thought it was just federal, but because often people are either their feds or their provincial regulators, but you're, you had some really interesting posts in, uh, as a director level and director of air resources, uh, as well as in, uh, in mining uh, and energy mines. And I guess at that time they put oil and gas and mining all together in one uh, one package, right? So, That's right. and at the start of your career, you were working in um, as, a, as an instrument, instrumentation meteorologist and research scientist with Environment Canada. So in your career in Canada, you have seen um, how regulations and policies play out in the environmental field uh, at the federal level and how you have to consider, you know, different jurisdictions and Canada is kind of an interesting situation being that we're a federation with territories and indigenous territories now as well. Uh, and then also at the provincial level where you have the interplay of the province and the municipalities and so forth, as well as looking at the federal, federal provincial relations. So welcome. Uh, it's going to be great to, uh, to go through this stuff with you. And I really thank you for taking the time to have a chat with me and, and all the others that are on this call. I look forward to it, David. So, I mean, the first question is that, that I have is, um, what what brought you to this field? Like, you clearly were drawn to atmospheric science uh, at <laughs> at least at, at a university level, but perhaps even earlier. Yes, much earlier. Well, it it helps when your father's a meteorologist as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that would have to be the basic influence right there. Yeah. But it's intergenerational now because you like well one yes. of your sons is a meteorologist and your other son's an engineer right but still works right. with environmental issues but more or less very definitely yes yeah. yes so it's been <laughs> it's been a family trait for a long time yeah um so when when you started to when you chose to set out at that time when you when you started your studies at that time i guess the environmental industry wasn't really much of an industry, was it? I mean, uh, even when I started, it wasn't much. It was kind of an industry, but it wasn't. There wasn't an environment industry. No, there really was, wasn't an environmental industry in in the broad sense. There were lots of segments of of what ultimately became the environmental industry, but no, not at that time. Mm -hmm. it, 
I was I was in the well. I started off with with meteorology at the University of Washington in Seattle, and and uh, did my bachelor's there. Yeah, you'll be interested to know that in fact at that time, one summer I was a summer student as a, as a technician, basically mm -hmm. operating up in uh, uh, Point Bello. No, uh, sorry, uh, uh, northern tip of Alaska. And we were, in fact, measuring Point Barrow. And we were, in fact, I was in charge of uh, looking after the measurements of CO2 at that time. Okay. And we were actually measuring CO2 in the atmosphere. That was one of the two stations the U.S. had, the one in Mauna Loa and the one in Point Barrow. What year was that? So in fact, this was in uh, 1966. My gosh. So you're like an, you're an original gangster of the climate movement. Yeah, I'm an original gangster in this game, yes. <laughs> Long before, well, not long before, because in fact, uh, of course, the whole climate change issue com comes from the 1800s, yeah. 1896, the Savannah's, uh, well, Arena, Arenas, sorry, I've got his name wrong there. Anyway, he basically, on the back of an envelope, calculated what would happen if CO2 went up in the atmosphere. Right. And he was remarkably accurate. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I mean... So, <laughs> it's well, taken us since 1896 to start getting going on this issue. But it's not like so. What, that's another good point. Is is you know what the leaky bucket the leaky bucket model? Have you ever heard of this? The did you ever? I, you didn't teach it to me. It was Ian Strachan at McGill that used that in his climatology course? The leaky bucket model. So it's a great metaphor for climate change because it basically here's the bucket and then you have water coming in and you have yes. a leak in it, right? Yep. Right. And so this is the energy balance of the earth. And I use this all the time for bankers. This is a climate change conscious. Look, it all boils down to a leaky bucket. We have a hole here, which is the atmospheric window, which is the leak in the bucket. Right. Right. Based on our energy balance, everything works out, you know, because the leak is the flow in is equal enough to the leak out so that we don't have That's a right. buildup of water energy in the atmosphere. This leak in the bucket is getting smaller because we are clogging up that atmospheric window with greenhouse gases. Right. And what happens when that when that occurs? You get this buildup of water. So they get it right away when I use that. Like, oh, okay, I see it. So oh, look at yeah, but that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually an effective metaphor. So, but in yes. terms of your stuff, like in your career, I mean, you are drawn to government applications uh, and dealing with um, with policy and regulations and instrumentation yes. and measurement pretty much yes. right away. Yes. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, well, meteorology at that time was pretty well a, a federal issue, so yeah. that was a natural place to start. And once I got into the meteorology and, and got into the instrumentation and everything, I got to know a number of the people who were involved in the, the sort of the po science policy side, and yeah. I got quite interested in that because I really wanted to try and create change, yeah. more change than, than was occurring at the time, and certainly more change than I could do when I was developing an instrument for Mirabelle Airport, you know, mm -hmm. that was that was something, but it wasn't really making change. So I moved uh, when they moved the meteorological uh, headquarters, sorry, the assistant deputy minister moved from Toronto to, to Ottawa, his mm -hmm. office. I was invited to go in there as, as one of the science coordinators mm -hmm. and then got involved quite heavily with the Ottawa scene mm -hmm. and the changes that were occurring there and, so, and the start of the realization that environment was an issue. But that would have been a really interesting time. That would have been in the late 60s into the 70s, right? That's that right. right. So, yeah. so, so for those like the, we've got 30 people on this call, for that time, for anybody who's done any kind of history of environmental assessment was a critical time because the 1969 was Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Uh, the start right. of the environmental assessment process was early 70s, 73, 74, EARP and, and the National Environmental Policy Act in the United States. So all That's of right. the environmental policies were really starting in that era. You were in the middle of everything, right? In fact, I was involved with the initial establishment of the environmental assessment process in Canada. Yes. Not surprising. So <laughs> that sort of got me into the, the much broader area and, and out of I. I went in as a science coordinator from the meteorological side, but, but obviously had to, to rub shoulders with uh, biologists and mm -hmm. social scientists and all sorts of others who were into that game too. Right. So I really got a broad picture. 
And so in that sense, that time, I basically moved into even a broader area when I was involved with the the whole area of research, yeah. the environmental research associated with the offshore oil and gas operations. Yeah. And I set up, uh, I had to set up the, the policies, regulations, the law, in fact, the legislation as well for dealing with the environmental assessment work that was necessary to approve offshore oil and gas operations at the time. Right. And that must have been new to a lot of policymakers because they had up until that point in the science would have been, I mean, was it new? Was it because were they used to having like an atmospheric scientist come and say, look, this is you need to have this level of assessment. We need to have data. We need to have monitoring. We need to have this. Oh, it was it was being let's say it was being learned in the process. Right. You know, we, we were going through it. They, they knew they had to do the environmental assessment because that had already got in place. Yeah. What they didn't have was a way to coordinate the work from all the different uh, companies that were involved. Yeah. So what they did was they leaned on the federal government to set up a body that would then take get the money and get the research done that the, they could all benefit from. And that sort of relates to that issue you wanted to talk about, which is how does industry get involved? Yes. The key was that instead of having one company, each company doing it individually mm -hmm. and the problems that are associated with that and the competition that would get in and the waste of money that would occur, mm -hmm. what we did was we set up a process where there was one group, uh, the, there was one group, which was the Environmental Studies Revolving Fund mm -hmm. in Ottawa, that served to basically put out a tithe to all the industries involved mm -hmm. and then coordinated the research with the companies providing their own environmental experts to serve on the panel to select the research. And then we basically went out and got the research done and then everybody could benefit from that. So mm -hmm. it was, it kept the cost down mm -hmm. and it shared the load amongst all the different companies and it, frankly, I think it probably produced a better result because we were independent mm -hmm. of the industry itself so that the results that came out of it were, were not dependent, or say, were not easily associated with saying, well, that's because that company said that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have to believe it. And the result was we didn't because we were a central, central body in the government that did it, which sure. was a very good model. So, but that brings me to my next question is that none of that happens without policy or regulation. So, or legislation. Or legislation. So, so, let's start with this. How and that, that, that actually helps industry. Yeah. Well, they know what the goals posts are. So, how important would you say regulations and the rules, I'm saying making the rules, are for dealing with environmental problems in your? long breadth of history of, of your career. <laughs> Do we need them? Absolutely, because it, it is the, well, let's say it's the role of government to give a direction to everybody. Yeah. The environmental assessment process, for example, was a role of government saying to industry and to everybody else in the public and everybody that, okay, we've got to look at the environment in a broader context than we have in the past. We've got to consider all parts of it. Mm -hmm. And we've then got to weigh the environmental effects with business and everything else. And that in a sense is a policy. It then became legislation. It then became regulation as well. And the environmental studies revolving fund was the very same thing. We there was a, a policy that government was going to serve as the focal point to help industry. And it came out of the Canada Oil and Gas Lands Administration. That was the body, mm -hmm. but it was a de determination that that would help industry and all the companies went along with it. And it meant that all the companies had the same policy. They knew what the policy was. They knew what the regulation, the legislation was and they knew what the regulations were and how they could fit into it. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you know, hey, I had an, uh, a fun opportunity of actually taxing industry yeah. for the research work for environmental sciences. And we did, we did work on uh, icebergs and scouring, all sorts of things way outside my field of expertise, but I served as the, sort of the scientific uh, 
coordinator for this work. So that funded fundamental research there to some degree, that whole process. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we funded uh, people going out and counting birds. Yeah, yeah. But, but, not just counting birds, you had to then also assess what the atmosphere was doing and, and cause the birds to go there. In other words, you weren't just counting birds, you were trying to figure out why the birds were there and therefore being able to predict what you should do to avoid having a problem from them, causing right. a problem to them. So it was far more than just um, the, the science in, in one particular area. It was starting to bring science, a whole group of sciences together mm -hmm. to start seeing cause and effect and be able to do what the environmental assessment process really was designed to do, which was forecast and therefore prevent problems from occurring. So it was a very different sort of thinking process than had gone on in the past, which was each of the scientific fields covered its own work. Yeah. And didn't worry about the interaction of the various parts. Yeah, kind of the birth of inter uh, integrated environmental science and research that is now kind of common today. That's right. At that, that time, it was not. Yeah. yeah well, because even, I, like I can remember talking to with some of the biologists who who'd been out and counted birds for 30 years. And I said, why the birds are there? Yeah. Oh, well, because that's where they go to nest. Well, why? Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to have the social, the, sorry, the ocean science people. You got to have the atmospheric sciences people there mm -hmm. to understand why. And you got to have the ecologists there. You know, and all of those reasons are the, are the ones that will give you the reason why the birds were there. Right. So, so given that, like in your, we know we've established that policy and regulations are important, right? Absolutely yeah. fundamental. So given in your career then, um, what are some of the major environmental issues that came up? I, I, I can think of a couple off the top of my head, but I want you to pick like the, the top ones and how were they, how were they, uh, what were some of the key ones you dealt with that came up and how were they dealt with from a reg, like what was the regulatory response? You know, you remember the ozone layer, acid rain, like what are some ones that you saw successfully tackled through regulations and policy? Okay, let's start with the acid rain one because it's fascinating in, in the sense that it wasn't just the environment that, uh, that caused us to really get to, to deal with that one. It was also the health issues. So it was important to recognize that environment includes health. Mm -hmm. And if you looked at Sudbury and the problems that they were having and the deforestation that was going on, I mean, the nothing group in some of those areas. Mm -hmm. And you were able to monitor, for instance, the flow of the stack from, from Sudbury all the way over the Great Lakes from mm -hmm. the satellites, the weather satellites, because show you these big plumes. Mm -hmm. You had the, the work that was done in the, in the, uh, in the Northern Lakes which was tremendously important in understanding the impact on the fish. You mm -hmm. had the health issues that were associated with it, which were showing up in the health records. Mm -hmm. So you had something that was really getting to people's attention. Mm -hmm. And then you had the international issue as well, because the Americans were getting annoyed about the, the pollution that was coming from Canada into the US. Right. And Canada was getting annoyed about the pollution that was coming into Canada from the, US, from the US, so it was both ways. Mm -hmm. And it, it, then it was a joint policy initiative from provinces, a number of provinces and the federal governments, both of them. Mm -hmm. You had the science supporting that from a number of different uh, uh, fields of science. Mm -hmm. And basically they set up targets and they went at it. Mm -hmm. And you brought in regulations, you brought in the legislation and regulations to reduce it, and it was successful. Right. And you got industry on side because they clearly understood what they had to achieve. Yeah. Because you set up a policy and followed it and stayed with it. Mm -hmm. That was the key of the whole thing. The CFC issue was actually quite a different one. And yeah. there's a lot of myth and, and stories around the wonderful work that was done. Uh, I hate to shoot some of it down, mm -hmm. but there was an absolute key discovery in the U.S. by one of the companies, and I won't name which one, mm -hmm. that discovered how they could 
deal with this problem of the of the refrigeration and air conditioning and everything without using CFCs. Mm -hmm. And that triggered the whole issue. We, we were getting the science. We understood the, the implications of CFCs mm -hmm. and the implication on the, on the uh, ozone hole in, in the States, in the, sorry, in, in Antarctica mm -hmm. and over Canada too. But mm -hmm. the main problem was over, over the South. But it was really the fact that industry suddenly discovered a way to solve the problem that allowed the whole thing to go. To go. Because so, in fact, it became a corporate interest. Right. So it wasn't, it wasn't as much of a, of a stick, like you didn't need the stick as much as you did for the acid rain situation. You needed, you needed the stick, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because you needed to level the playing field. Yeah. And that is the key thing about the policies and regulations and legislation that go along. You've got to make sure that the playing field is level for all the companies and all the groups who are dealing with the issue. Mm -hmm. And if that isn't there, then you've got a problem. Okay. Because you've then got a corporate competition. You've got, should, should a company go out and make changes now which will cost them perhaps uh, while other companies are keeping their costs down by not doing it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly have the government turn around a few years later and say, oh, well, we'll now have fun those people to make the change. Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly the companies that were out, the leaders that were out in front and took the, took the hit frequently mm -hmm. because of being out in front, Mm -hmm. They look at their competition and say, well, why didn't we bother doing that? Exactly. We should have just waited. Yeah. So, and that's, that leads us to the climate change issue because you would say that there's an early adopter advantage, but maybe there can be an early adopter disadvantage if the policies aren't formulated correctly, correct? That's, and if they're not consistent, if they're right. not held continually. Yeah. And if you don't give clear instruction, clear yeah. direction, yeah. follow it up with action and yeah. i think we've 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 seen that many many times where companies have been uh, you know a policy has come out we want to do a particular thing and then government changes and it pulls back mm -hmm. and it doesn't continue doing it mm -hmm. and the result is that the companies who were believing that this was what they were supposed to be doing mm -hmm. suddenly find themselves in an economic disadvantage for sure. They have to. They now. Then they have to find some way to try and make it look like what they're doing is an advantage mm -hmm. over what the other guy is is not doing. Well, I did when That's I started. Real problem. When I started the company back in 2005, one of the first clients. I, I won't name them, but they were a big refinery out east. You'll. <laughs> I never named the name, but you probably know what I'm talking about. And uh, we did some work with them on the greenhouse gas issue, did their carbon footprint, and it was not small. But the response to that was, okay, interesting. You've got a big footprint. Um, so what do we need to do? And we were like, I had a, I always had a big champion and inside their environmental guy was a colleague of mine from the university actually. And he was really keen to like, to like, let's come up with like a renewable strategy. And this is back in 2008, nine. And, uh, and they were like, well, we're not regulated. We don't know we're going to be regulated. And Harper's plan was, tabled at that point in time, but wasn't kind of finalized. So they said, good to know, move forward. Until we're regulated and we know we're gonna have consistent regulations imposed on us, we're not gonna put the effort in to, or commitment to make the changes to whatever, reduce, whatever it would be, if it's CCS or any, anything like that. Well, I think we have a perfect example of that in the auto industry. Yeah. Because each time the government in, in the U.S. and Canada, or Canada and the U, whichever one goes first, has come out with uh, targets for pollution from their vehicles, yeah. industry, of course, squawks tremendously and says they can't do it simply because they haven't put their minds to it yet. But we have efficiency gains when the government is consistent and says, okay, in the year X, we have to have, we have to be 20% better than we were in year Y. Mm -hmm. The problem comes then when the next government comes in and suddenly backs off on that. And industry then suddenly stops or some, some companies, many of the companies will. Yeah. They'll stop the research. Mm 
And I think we, we saw that with the EV1, uh, the famous yeah. General Motors uh, electric vehicle, the minute the government's backed off on their, their electric vehicle uh, standard, then the EV1 was basically taken out of the market. And what, year was that? what year was that? EV1. I, I'm sorry about that. I, uh, I've forgotten which year it was, but what? it was... Like the 80s, was it like a, but it was a, it was a long time before what we're currently seeing with EV technology. Oh yes, oh yeah. yes. EV1 yeah. was, was a, a brilliant electric vehicle. Yeah. It was in the 90s. 90s. Point. Yeah. Uh, but again, if, if it, as is happening now, industry is starting to get the picture and they're starting to look at the whole business of electrification of vehicles and everything. But as long as government keeps requiring them, to either be more efficient or get more electric vehicles out, then we'll keep progressing a change. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, then it'll slide back again. So the lessons learned are then, I would say, if I were to summarize the key, the important learnings from that are consistency and clarity in terms of the regulatory frameworks that are put forward. Industry, and, go ahead. Yes, I was going to say it has to be very clear. Everybody has to understand what it is. Yeah. And everybody has to be held accountable for it. You know, in, in the sense of each in the in the sense of each of the sectors when you're doing it. For instance, buildings are way down the list that you often see uh, for global climate change issues. Right. And yet building are going to be with us for 50 to 80 years probably right they should be we should be worried about them right now we should be looking at standards which are way beyond what came out in the uh, r2000 sch scheme and yet their homes being built in in british columbia that don't even meet the r2000 standards you know hmm. okay. you know so what are we dealing with we're going to have these houses around for 50 years they're yeah. going to use up energy yeah they're, they could so easily be built to a much higher standard than they are currently, mm -hmm. but no one's bothering to push it. Yeah. So it, it becomes a problem. And you've got to have your policy has, you have to be consistent with your policy and you have to get on with the, with the job by getting your regulations and your, sorry, your legislation and your regulations to follow up. You have to monitor mm -hmm. and you've got to, take action when people don't do it all yeah. of that part is part of it mm -hmm. communication is not getting us anywhere look we've been going at this issue since 1988 mm -hmm. okay when you start with the the, the climate change conference in toronto mm -hmm. where or changing atmosphere i think is what it was called mm -hmm. but that that then formed the ipcc which started in in the fall of 1988 1990 was the first IPCC report. We've had them every five years since then. Mm -hmm. Where are we? Do you look back at some of the reports that came out in 1990, 1995? You look at the provincial ones, you look at the federal ones. There were lots of good plans in there. Mm -hmm. And people have been creating more plans and creating more plans and yeah. creating more plans. Yeah. And yet we're not dealing with the issue really in a, in a broad sense because we're not being consistent, we're not setting out a policy and then following it and then monitoring it mm -hmm. and making sure that everybody does it. You know, okay. it's, it's simple. We're, what are we doing? We're communicating. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. 1988 is a few years ago mm -hmm. and we've been communicating on that issue ever since. There's not an awful lot of people who haven't heard about global climate change. Yes. And there's not an awful lot of people who don't know that there are things that can be done. Now, there are people who still want to deny it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who still want flat earth society. There are people who still don't believe in, in evolution. Mm -hmm. You're not going to change those people. Yeah. Ed education isn't going to get us there anywhere. Yeah. And never has. It yeah. helps. It helps a politician to feel that they're doing something. Yeah. But is it really doing anything? No. Certainly not after this many years of trying to do education. Mm -hmm. you build a little bit into the schools. Heavens, if you build it into the schools in 1990, mm -hmm. 
you'd already have everybody educated practically. Well, in this course, the one one of the ones I'm teaching right now, the graduate course, we had our launch last. Uh, every unit is, has a, a launch, and they did last night. And this last unit, or second to last unit, is on communication. The communication is a large part of it. And I said, like, communication is important for sure. And you know, I work in that area, but sure. without without rules, it doesn't matter. You can communicate all day. I gave the example of the work that, that I, when I started my career back in 2000, doing the World Expo work, like designing pavilions for a World Expo in Germany, very progressive yeah. communications about all the technology and stuff. Now, was I expecting everybody that went to that pavilion to walk away and go like become energy efficient and you know change their life? No, they're probably like, they could just go jump in their SUV or whatever and go home. Like that's not gonna change their behavior necessarily, right? Um, that's right. And nor is it going to, to change a society's behavior. This is where the role of like, of regulations and sticks and carrots come into play. Well, and this is, this is where the policy becomes so important. One of the things that is going on right now is this whole issue of, of uh, carbon tax. Yes. Okay. We had a, a sort of similar tax, shall we say, the sustainability tax that came into BC in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. And the concept was that, uh, that uh, you would basically assist industry, by, but the sustainability tax would come into government and then would get spent by the Ministry of Environment for the purpose of decreasing the impact on, on the environment of human activity. Yeah. Well, it suffered the same problem of all taxes. After about a year or two of the sustainability fund getting the money directly, mm -hmm. the Minister of Finance turned around and said, oh, well, environment's getting this money from sustainability, so we can cut its budget by the same amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you reduced the money that was coming in for the purpose of creating change in the environment, mm -hmm. and it's become just part of the total tax collection mm -hmm. of the government. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer surplus. Yeah, I mean, not surplus. There's no longer extra money for a particular purpose. It's very much like the gas tax, which was initially put in place for the purpose of, of uh, improving roads in Canada and is now just part of the general revenue and a very little part of it goes into actually, well, none of it goes into fixing the roads. The roads then get covered by the municipalities and other things. But the carbon tax is the same sort of thing. It's a, it is based on a false assumption. Okay. And if the false, the basic false assumption is that people make their decisions based on economics. Mm -hmm. Economics is on, the cost of something is only a small part of the decision-making process. And I think we have constantly seen the, the, uh, the problems with trying to assume that everybody is making their decisions based on their best economic uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, why buy the fancy road, uh, red uh, sports car mm -hmm. when in fact uh, a very small car, which is using far less fuel, would do the same job? Yes, yeah. because of other factors. Right. You know, economics has the supply and demand curve, and that's that's a solid one. Mm -hmm. Their whole business beyond that of trying to assume that people are going to make their decisions based on the economic well-being is is false, and therefore it leads us to things like, oh well, we'll have a carbon tax, and everybody will pay the pay the cost, mm -hmm. and we'll then make make turn that money into making it useful for dealing with climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the climate tax suddenly became just another tax. Mm -hmm. It is no longer earmarked for just climate change issues. Mm -hmm. It's being used for other purposes. It isn't anything like high enough to make a real impact on anybody. Mm -hmm. And yet it is beautiful that because it looks like you're doing something. Mm -hmm. It looks like you're addressing the climate because you've got a climate tax, mm -hmm. a climate change tax. The carbon tax isn't going to do anything. It's it's a sop 
it basically fools everybody into thinking they're doing something when in fact they're not. What, so, so what lessons can be learned from, I mean, I always try and look at the CFC issue and the Sox and the Knox issue as, par, as similar, I wouldn't say parallel or equal, but similar. Sox and Knox is very similar um, in the sense that, you know, you, you, can, you can set up a regulatory framework and a monitoring program for this. Sox, yes. Knox. You have to report to us what your emissions are on a quarterly or whatever it is, where your frequency is. And uh, if you don't meet your targets, um, you're going to get fined. You know, that's just the way it works, right? Um, but yeah, the difference between that and climate change, though, is the fact that the SOX and NOx produce sulfates and nitrates. Yeah. The sulfates and nitrates are fine particulates. Yeah. The fine particulate has a direct health impact, as we showed in the early 1990s, absolutely direct. Yeah. You can, you can plot for instance the london fog which was a sulfate problem and you can see the the medical implications mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. uh, you can see it constantly in in canada in, in bc for instance uh, the burning of fossil fuel oh uh, sorry of uh, wood mm -hmm. in the communities where the air quality is very gets very poor mm -hmm. it causes medical problems okay those are direct People feel them, they know about them. You mm -hmm. can assess it directly. It's a short-term problem. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, David, will experience it. Yeah. Okay. You, David, will not experience, unlikely at least, mm -hmm. hopefully not, the, the 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 huge rise in the oceans that may come about from the collapse of the ice caps in the south in, in, uh, in uh, the south mm -hmm. okay the, mm -hmm. the big polar ice caps that are the problems in greenland and in Antarctica, antarctica will probably not cause a big problem for 50 100 years yeah most of us won't be alive then yeah it isn't an issue that i have to deal with from my health point of view today right okay uh, the sulfate problem, the acid rain issue, even the CFC one mm -hmm. was far more direct yeah. because you could assess it and it was in a short term. You could do something in a short term and see the impact. Correct. Okay. In global climate change, we're dealing with something that is definitely intergenerational. Mm -hmm. if, if it occurs the way it is expected to occur, then 50 to 100 years down the line, they're going to have real problems. Mm -hmm. But there will probably not get there because we will see all sorts of changes that occur in the meantime, both attribution, you know, ways of avoiding the problems as well as as, as uh, actual technology changes that are going to really generate major changes mm -hmm. in society. To the good, by the way. Mm -hmm. most, of the, most of these changes that are going to occur will be to the good. Just just look at the LED lights now, which are mm -hmm. far superior to the old tungsten lights. Mm -hmm. And we've done that in our generation. Yes. So uh, these changes are going to occur, but it's much harder to have a public response to that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you need that policy direction. You need governments at the broad scale to mm -hmm. take that on and do something about it because the individual isn't going to be impacted in their day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. as they are with the other, with particularly with the CSCs or with NOx, sorry, the, with acid rain and NOx. They mm -hmm. were definitely affected directly. Mm -hmm. So carbon tax, um, all the, the economists that I work with now and that I know, I mean, they, and I've seen the literature, the least cost to society, that it's the most economically efficient way. If it's not the most effective way, what are we talking then? What do you recommend? What's a more effective and direct and, and uh, will produce better results as a regulatory approach, policy approach for greenhouse gas emissions reduction, mitigation? Well, uh, first of all, you've basically got to get governments to uh, governments to accept that they have a responsibility in the whole issue, and that's where the public can make an influence. But then governments have to start very clearly sending a signal as to what they want done 
Yeah. I have to set a very clear policy frame, excuse me, a very a clear policy framework mm -hmm. in which industry can then operate or industry and the public can operate. Mm -hmm. I think we're starting to see that now in the whole electrification of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the push from CARB in the States and California mm -hmm. and the support that we basically gave them initially, actually in BC when I was there, mm -hmm. helps to generate the, 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 the Teslas mm -hmm. of this world that mm -hmm. then take on and really get moving. You know, Tesla has really pushed that industry and now we're suddenly starting to see all sorts of change occurring across the whole globe with companies doing that. Now, that's one part, mm -hmm. but you see government has to be doing far more than just the electrification, which is, which is CARB's push. Mm -hmm. Because when you start talking about the electrification issue, you now have got the problem of the generation of electric electricity, mm -hmm. and yeah. you've got the whole problem of of the renewable fuels of which hydro has to be a major component mm -hmm. you've got the whole issue that associated with that of the fact that in many cases the hydropower well, in fact the wind and solar don't necessarily come from the places where you need the power they mm -hmm. often come from other areas we've mm -hmm. got to see then a federal government initiative for instance in canada to get a, a Canada-wide grid going, but we don't even have that. Yeah, we've, um, we've got to, to start looking at things from a from a countrywide perspective, which means the federal government has to be really involved in this thing. Yeah. You cannot do this the way that even the way that they, the the acid rain was done, which was with basically Ontario mm -hmm. and a number of the states in the U.S. who are associated uh, with around the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And you've got to start looking at a much larger context. You've got to look at it as being a federal lead mm -hmm. and a federal recognition that, that you've got power issues, you've got design issues in, in, for instance, in buildings, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You've got to think of um, how you move people. You know, we've just had the Greyhound bus system go down. Well, yeah. then you've got to get some other way of doing it. Mm -hmm. everybody isn't going to be able to ride a bicycle. Yes. You've got groups that are pushing bicycles, but they're not in a context mm -hmm. of what does it mean? You know, people can't in the middle of, as you well know, in the middle of November, uh, November December, January, February in Ottawa and, and central Ontario will be riding around on bicycles very easily. Mm -hmm. Some will, yeah. no question. Yeah. Some will get the big fat wheels and they'll go, but yeah. you, you've got to have a system you've got to have a whole system in place mm -hmm. that that doesn't and you cannot do that uh, trying to assume that the municipalities can grow the whole thing and then the provinces can sort of take it from the municipalities and then up to the government mm -hmm. the federal government has to get involved mm -hmm. and has to start looking at the whole issue from a broad perspective mm -hmm. and pull together the initiatives mm -hmm. you're not going to get a power grid across canada this is the way we have a railroad system until the federal government's involved. It was involved in the rail system. Yeah. It was involved in the road system. We have those. We don't have a grid. Mm -hmm. Why don't we? Once we've got a grid, we don't even have the, the capacity yet to do all the storage that's necessary to move the power from one time to another. We have groups out there fighting against windmills, against solar power, against hydropower, against geothermal power. All of them claiming they're environmentalists, but yeah. they're not looking at the realities mm -hmm. of the issue. And new and again, nuclear. you need the broad context. And don't forget mm -hmm. nuclear. Well, the nuclear it plays a very, very important role. And I was involved actually with the with a task force that was looking at the whole issue of radioactive waste from uh, mm -hmm. low-level sources, which includes hospitals, by the way. Yeah. And there are there are ways to solve these problems. But we've got we've got environmental groups that are fighting for single issues instead of looking at the broad picture. We've got governments which are are looking at silos instead of the broad picture. Mm -hmm. And until until we can get a few people out there who are going to start looking at the issue broadly, mm 
and recognize that we do have to change the way we're doing things and it can't be done piecemeal. It has to be done on a broad scale. So in that sense, you, you kind of lead into my next question, which is and why, I, why I indicated that Canada is a relatively unique, as is the United States with, with different states having quite a bit of power within each one in, in their jurisdiction. But in Canada, as a federation, each of the provinces, territories uh, have a fair degree of autonomy on, along certain, in certain ways, you know, say DFO, for instance, fisheries is, is largely federal, um, whereas there's, there's other jurisdictions um, that, that they have some degree of autonomy from the, the federal government. So how do, we, how do we reconcile that? Like say, for instance, you know, Alberta is always saying like, look, give us the targets for greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and we will find our way to, to meet those targets. Like give us the targets and we will go and we'll do it, whether it's using carbon capture and storage or, or whatever, you know, whatever it is. So the, my question is, how do we deal with, and this has been an issue for a long time, harmonization uh, uh, and the balance between this kind of the open federalism model, which I think Harper was more of a proponent of, like let the provinces do their thing. And then what we have now, which is, uh, well, at least what they seem to <laughs> say a lot, which is the, the like the, the federal government kind of overimposing things. How, what's the balance, and how do we how do we get this system to work better? We're back to the whole issue of policy, aren't we? We are. I know, but I'm yeah, asking. The you. whole issue goes back to the, the you know, what is wrong with a company responding in a different way, one one, one company versus another. There isn't any reason, provided they have a common objective when right. they're getting at. Yeah. And okay, if 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 you don't have a clear policy, if you don't have a clear objective, and if you don't monitor and uh, appropriate uh, penalties if if people don't do meet their requirements, then you've got a problem. Right. And you've got exactly the problem we have because. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere, the global climate change is not a individual issue. Mm -hmm. You and I cannot make a change. Mm -hmm. You can argue that, well, Canada is only 2% of the problem and therefore not, not part of it either. Yeah, but it, yeah. it becomes a bit, of, a bit more difficult when you've got a large number of people. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a very clear set of instructions Mm -hmm. as to what you want to achieve, not how, not how. Mm -hmm. there, there are sort of two forms and, and uh, your uh, Dr. Rhodes, when she was on, talked about the two forms of regulation, for instance. And right. There's the prescriptive, the very clearly defined one and the target one. Yeah. And what I'm talking about constantly is the one where you set a target. Okay. You, you set a basic uh, outline of what you want, not how you want to achieve it. Yeah. Leave it up to individuals, leave it up to companies, leave it up to it, all sorts of different mechanisms mm -hmm. for achieving that objective. Mm -hmm. But let's have a very clear set of objectives and let's stick to them mm -hmm. and stay with them and mm -hmm. not keep changing them. And just because of, well, we've changed political parties and therefore we're going to change it again. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the problem we've got. So our biggest problem is we don't have leadership. So if we were to have if we were to have set targets and not intensity based because Harper was all over the intensity based emissions reduction yeah. right yeah. Yeah. that doesn't work absolute no. fixed targets at a provincial level Alberta you have to meet this target by 2030 here's a here's your your cap right for emissions on an annual basis mm -hmm. and you're showing reductions each year similar to for C for British Columbia and the other provinces is is that the type of clarity you're you're talking about you're you're sort of into the cap and trade side of it. Well, I use cap as as a as a just a, yeah. a word, but it, it, people always go to cap and trade when you say. But I'm talking about a clear target. Like you, we need yes. to have these emissions reductions targets met by this time period. Time bounded targets. That would probably yes. That would probably get you get you underway. Mm -hmm. You have to give more support, I think, to industry than that, mm -hmm. in the sense that you need to also help them to understand what it is you're trying to achieve and how and how they might do it. Okay. For instance, back in the yeah, back in the 80s, there was a group called SIPEC in the in the Energy Mines and Petroleum Resources, which which was a an association of industry and government focused on 
trying to encourage energy efficiency and help companies find ways of, of achieving their objectives. Mm -hmm. And the federal government actually, in its research work, was helping to fund studies that would then help industries to achieve higher efficiency. Mm -hmm. It was up to the individual companies, of course, to actually uh, implement the research and mm -hmm. implement the, the changes that were needed. Mm -hmm. But the government was there, it set targets for efficiency and it carried out research to help people know how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they would go ahead now, it didn't have all the solutions clearly, but it did fund that. And that's part of what government needs to do. So, it, so it's one thing to set the target, but it has to be out there assisting mm -hmm. the various groups to achieve that objective. Right. So it, it has research it needs to do, and it's research, it's, it's, it's uh, fundamental research, and it's also applied research. But it needs to use its research powers. It also needs to do something else which is absolutely fundamental, mm -hmm. and which Dr. Rhodes did not touch on, and mm -hmm. that's uses purchasing policy. Okay. Governments purchase a huge number of things in Canada. Mm -hmm. It is not currently using its purchasing power to help with global, global climate change issues. Okay. And yet it needs to. Industries in Canada had developed approaches on electric vehicles. In, well, in early 1990s, there was a, there was a company in, in British Columbia that mm -hmm. wanted to help ge generate interest in electric vehicles. They had developed a, a vehicle and they wanted it to be used in places. Mm -hmm. Provincial government, one, wouldn't support it. Two, didn't buy any of them. Mm -hmm. Three, didn't help with the regulations. In fact, it allowed Transport Canada uh, to bring in regulations which killed the industry. Mm. So, you know, here was a place where government could have provided leadership, it, it was meeting objectives. It, it needed to bring in proper regulations that could be met, mm -hmm. the industry, and then it needed to turn around and purchase some vehicles. Right. As you know, at Royal Roads, we, we actually brought in some electric vehicles, mm -hmm. converted them because we wanted to show you people, mm -hmm. you students, that mm -hmm. you could actually use electric vehicles mm -hmm. and very, very efficiently. Mm -hmm. And that was in, what, 96, 97. Yep. Well, we're a couple of years after that now. Yeah. You know, and, and yet we had a fight to get those things licensed and approved and everything else. Uh, you know, why, why were universities doing that when government should have been doing it? Yeah. yeah. So you need to use your purchasing power. You need to use your research power. You need to use consistency. You need to use your regulations. You need legislation. Mm -hmm. And you need uh, overall, you need consistency with your policy. Great. And once you once you've done that, then you release the the entrepreneurship that yep. is out there, yep. and you support industry. Ballard Industries got yep. money from Energy Mines and Resources back in the oh eighties. Mm -hmm. I was involved with helping them get that money. Mm -hmm. Where is Ballard now? You know they're not. They have been, they, they wanted to electrify with ballard fuel cells, the transit system in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Provincial government didn't support it. Mm -hmm. They actually had buses on the, on the road that were running on ballard fuel cells. Mm -hmm. Well, where was the federal government, to, where was the provincial government to support it? Mm -hmm. You know, governments aren't supporting their own industries, in fact. Mm -hmm. And we look to the U.S. and we say, oh, well, the U.S. has, uh, the industry doesn't need it. I'm sorry. Industry in the U.S. gets a huge amount of money. They just get it from their defense funds. Mm -hmm. And it, it just appears in the research and in the entrepreneurship, you know, they'll, they'll buy 10,000 razor blades at a ridiculous price because they help an industry get started. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. use razor blades, obviously. It's a, it's a silly example, but I mean, sometimes we we look at them 
and say, oh, you know, why did you pay thirty dollars for something that you can buy for about twenty cents? Because now you can buy it for twenty cents, but at the time when it was initially out there, industry needed a sufficient number of orders to be able to develop the capability to produce them in right. mass numbers. So and we ahead. don't seem to have we don't have a, we don't have the entrepreneurship support. Mm -hmm that goes beyond research into the, into the demonstration and into the actual purchasing. And we need those as well. Mm -hmm. Create a market for those, those early stage innovations. And you have to help industry prove it, mm -hmm. that they, they actually work, but you have to support your industries to do that or any group, frankly. Yeah. So in terms of, so we've, we've kind of covered some, some good ground here <laughs> uh, and, uh, but one of the key things is, and it, it does come back to, to what you have done here is communicate your experience with um, various issues and the successes and failures. So I know we've said that communication doesn't matter, but it does kind of matter because in some sense, because if we don't know that like uh, a, that a government that we elect should be making these kind of decisions and these kind of policies, you see what I'm saying? Like, there is yes. a role of communication there of making sure the public is aware of like, what is something that's actually legitimately going to help us with this problem? Yes. So what's your take but, on that? Like on, on strategic communication on the part to, to mobilize these kind of changes? Oh boy, that's a, that's a big issue because yeah. when I was thinking of communication, I was really thinking of trying to prove once again that climate change is an issue. And I don't think we need to spend our, our dollars on that. No, I think people get it. People get that. Yeah. I think I'm pretty sure yeah. that even the, even the most conservative people I know, uh, at, at the very least, they consider it a, a, a business risk if they don't address it. You know, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So what we the communication we've got to address really is the communication of how we get change, how we yeah. generate change in the whole process. 100%. So there is a role of communication there, but it's a very, very different Communicate. I'm sorry. I've got a poodle in it suddenly. Arrived. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just so, I've, here. so I've got. I'm going to open it up for questions because we're we're pushing an hour here now. So I've got one yeah. one Mirel. Uh, similarly, electric. So this is an interesting one. Actually, I saw a podcast a couple of weeks on this from uh, from a group in the United States. Mirel uh, said similarly, electrification of aviation is not yet supported. What's your take on uh, aviation and electrification of aviation? Well, in fact, we have the attempts being made by Harbor Air here, don't we? Yeah. Already. So there, there are start, there's a start to it. Yeah. They probably need some, this government support, as I've yeah. said, for the demonstration. They're doing it all by themselves because they see a market a potential in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I tip my hat to them. They're, they're doing it. This is similar to what uh, Tesla has done with the electric vehicle. Yeah. they'll probably help to generate change. Right. Uh, are we going to see electrification of large jets in the next little while? Probably not mm -hmm. because of the range problems and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Are we going to start seeing changes in efficiency as we did with the motor vehicles? Probably yes. Yeah. But if you're going to lift people off the, off the ground, you've got to put a fair amount of energy into it. The issue, of course, that comes with that is where does the energy come from that we need? Yeah. We need a lot more electrification. Yes. We need a lot more electricity if we're going to move that direction. And that means we've got to get all of our power systems going that we can. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the fossil fuels, but we've got to get groups that will get away from blocking mm -hmm. constantly all the efforts to get more power because we're, if we want to move toward more, more power, I mean, to electrify everything, we're going to need a lot of energy. We're not going to do it with energy efficiency. No, we'll need dams in BC. So why you're getting a dam issue, I think, inadvertently, right? Yep. <laughs> That's, one. That's part of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mirel, but Transport Canada does not change regulations to accept electric aircraft. So there's a regulatory issue there, apparently. Yep. Yep, because there clearly is a lack of federal leadership here. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of places where regulations are hampering progress. Right. And the, the uh, 
I know with the small scale electric uh, vehicles, mm -hmm. Transport Canada basically hamstrung the industry in Canada by limiting the speeds that they could go at to mm -hmm. virtually below what bicycles could do without mm -hmm. motors. Wow. You know, what was the point? Well, I'll, one of the arguments was because, oh, electric vehicles are so slow getting off the ground, getting started, that they can't clear an intersection as fast as a gasoline powered car can. Yeah. I'm sorry, anybody who knows anything about physics yeah. knows that the torque of an electric motor Much bigger. is very, very good at the bottom end. Yeah. 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 Uh, versus a, a gasoline engine, which is terrible at the low end. Yeah. So, but, and yet Transport Canada put in a regulation that killed it. Hmm. And there is clearly a need to get, to get uh, an awful lot of the regulatory hindrance that's out there mm -hmm. that is not being worked on uh, to solve the problem, but is really keeping them from being solved. So we had another the electric vehicle, the, the electric plane problems that uh, the harbor air is having with federal government is just another example of it. But again, where's the federal leadership? Yeah. Where's the clear direction to all of the departments mm -hmm. and the federal government that we've got to look at things? in a broader context. They should be getting behind that. They should get I'm sorry? They should be getting behind that. They should be they should be funding that, I would think. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Mary, um, uh, I believe that monitoring companies is the key. Uh, and this is in reference to greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, yes. Oh, I've got another good question here. Donna Miller, how do you transcend poli policies when governments change power? This is the big one. So you get a change in power. We talked about this a lot. Governments are, are inward looking, <laughs> right? You know, yep. their, their job is to get reelected to some degree. I mean, that's a big part of being a politician, right? That's right. Um, so how do you transcend that four year or, or shorter cycle that these parties have with these issues that clearly have the need for longer term solutions and policies that have a much larger, long, longer viewpoint. How do you do that? <laughs> that one, we need statesmen. Yes. Yeah, that's a good and That's what we're missing. We're, we've got fellowship as opposed to leadership. Yeah. And as long as we, as long as we keep electing people who are followers, followers yeah. who, who want to get elected by popularity in the sense of not what they're doing but because well we'll give you something extra if you vote for us or oh you don't like that so we won't support that you know, yeah. as long as we have that we're not going to go anywhere and we need statesmen we need people who are prepared to to go to the to the uh, ballot box and say hey this is what i stand for this is what i want to do but they're right now our political system is so controlled by one person mm -hmm. that it's a real difficulty if that person isn't a statesman. Yeah. Gilles Duceppe, I, I viewed as a, as a statesman. Different different kind of objectives yes. for yes. Bloc Québécois, but honestly, I have a lot yep. of time for Gilles Duceppe. Uh, Jason, maybe it comes down to follow the money of what determines the decisions. Um, in what sense? Jason, expand on that. Maybe it comes down to following what determines the decisions. Like, are you saying give the proper motivation for people? Companies lobby. Okay, so look at lobbying and seeing, uh, and presumably subsidies as well. Um, go ahead, Jim. Take again, on. again uh, that's that's the reality of what we're dealing with now. Again, if a statesman is out there, if you've got real leadership, then it will basically look at the industry lobby and you know deal with it appropriately it's one of the decision factors that have to come into it any time a politician is going to ma is making a decision the lobbying is going to be part of that decision making right. process you've got a couple interesting questions here that are related so first uh, joanna do you think there's a disconnect between the much needed top-down regulatory approach and the bottom-up education communication socio-cultural behavioral change approach meaning that you know, the society, the public, right, that's being governed needs to be aware of, of what the issues are. And I think we're aware on the climate change issue, the public, at least in Canada, for the most part, I think has a, has a good understanding of the issue. Whereas it, uh, the question here is, is there a disconnect between 
um, this, as we've talked about, a regulatory approach that can help to address that and um, a kind of a more of a bottom up approach. So we have a top down bottom up processes, informed public and responsive government bringing policies that meet the, the, the concerns of the public. I don't think you'll deal with the climate change issue bottom up. No. No. The, the only bottom up part is whether people are prepared to elect people who will actually get out there and, and bring in the policies because yeah. the individual can't do it. The individual, uh, the individual can do one one or two things, yeah. small things. They can certainly buy an electric vehicle. They can make sure that her <clears throat> house is heated in the most effective way. They can make sure their, their insulation is the best, but that's not gonna get us there. Yeah. You've got to have the industries, the associations, the larger groups involved and a common framework in which to work. It's a structural change. Bottom up, what we're doing. Hmm? Structural change does not come from bottom up mobilization. It, it can be encouraged. Like you can say, look, we need to do this, right? Because we've got you know thousands and millions of people in the street at climate yes. markets and so forth and so on. That's a signal to to the need for these kind of changes. But the big structural decisions and policies, like we're talking, like a national grid, for instance, or a national energy strategy. I mean, that doesn't come from. That comes from a government. That's right. Yeah. Yep, government has to do it. It can't, individuals are never going to solve this problem. With all the best interests and all the best intent, it doesn't, it, the only thing you can do is, is try to encourage the politicians to do something and set the policy and direction and then follow up on it and hold them accountable. We got another interesting question here from Caitlin. Yes, and how can governments become more agile in adapting legislation and regulations to address emerging issues? The process seems onerous. Now, this is an interesting one because, like, from an adaptation standpoint, like when we look at mitigation, sure, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. From an adaptation standpoint, look at the impact. Look at what's happening in Manitoba and Saskatchewan with the like. We're going to likely have droughts coming this growing season, right? This is this is part of the adaptation side of climate change, which is you know, it's there's a lot of uncertainty in in forest fires and the the biological response to all these kind of issues, the Arctic issues. So, I mean, the school of adaptive management and these kind of adaptive governments is predicated on the fact that you can change, you can course correct. So the question that Caitlin poses, which is a good question, is how can governments become more agile in terms of adapting or, or changing legislation or, or coming up with new legislation? Mm, how could governments become more agile? Wow. Yeah. Again, if we look back at how what we did in the 70s with the environmental assessment process, mm -hmm. one of the things that came out of that was that as environment became important, it became important at, at, at a policy level right at the top of government. And all departments, at one point, mm -hmm. all departments were told, you've got to assess what you're doing with regard to the impact on the environment. In other words, energy mines and resources, while well, I was there, in fact, <clears throat> we had to do our own environmental assessment mm -hmm. on projects, which before that we hadn't been doing it at all. So suddenly we had a, a, depart, a department of environmental affairs, a section on mm -hmm. environmental affairs, which I headed up mm -hmm. within energy mines and resources. Mm -hmm. Talk about a seeming conflict. But it was because of the environmental assessment process that had been adopted by government and put into legislation and mm -hmm. became a policy. So all departments had to then assess any cabinet document going up against the environment, mm -hmm. against the environmental assessment. And in fact, it became one of the sections on all cabinet proposals that went forward. Mm -hmm. There was a section on environmental assessment. There was a section on on uh, political implication, there was assess assessment on economic implications, you know, but it was, it suddenly became part of the process mm -hmm. of government. Mm -hmm. And that caused departments to have to look at the implications of what they were doing. And they had to basically hire people who they wouldn't normally have within their, their bailiwick mm -hmm. who had environmental backgrounds. Mm -hmm. 
was fortunate to be one of them. But that was because the government had made a commitment that it was going to actually do something mm -hmm. with regard to the environment. And then once you had that, and once you had a requirement that a cabinet document going forward for every consideration of cabinet, mm -hmm. you have a cabinet document going forward by some department, mm -hmm. it had to have a section which mm -hmm. talked about environmental assessment. Boy, does that you know, cause you to pay a little bit of attention. So you could do the same thing for climate change, really. You could have a yep. mandated every the climate risk, climate screen, yep. or what have you. See, Linda, what has have you done to reduce the reduce the greenhouse gases, or what are you doing to assist in mitigating the problem? Mm -hmm. Linda's got an interesting point here, in the sense that so some people say, well, legislation is legislation. You can't like there's only so a government can only be so agile. But Linda, it's a really interesting point is. This past year, governments have been agile with COVID. Regardless of whether we agree with the response overall, we have been, I mean, this has been an issue that they've had to respond to and actually kind of pivot regularly based on, you know, sometimes based on whimsy, it seems, but sometimes based on new findings about, say, the variants or with uh, the efficacy of various vaccines. And this mm -hmm. is constant kind of updating based on the best available information. So arguably you could say the same thing could happen with uh, environmental issues in general because by very nature and COVID you could put in the environmental category like it an environmental health issue uh, has caused us to be have this kind of like cyclical governance process. I mean I think perhaps it's not unreasonable to think that there can be some considerations for the climate in uh, in this kind of the way of the way in which we govern. Yes. In fact, we, we've got a perfect example, but you see the driver is a short term one. Yeah. And that makes it an awful lot easier uh, for government to respond because yeah. it directly impacts me, it directly impacts you right yeah. now. Yeah. And therefore, I'm willing to give up some of my personal freedoms. Yeah. Because there's a direct implication. And people aren't even reluctant to do that. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes. look at English Bay. <laughs> and, and then you try to put that into a context of, of a problem which is global in nature. It doesn't affect me. It probably is something that, in fact, my children may not even see that. And their children may be impacted on it. You know, it's, mm. it makes it an awful lot harder. That's why it's. Yeah, we, we've seen how quickly government can respond Yes, once it sets itself a target. Yes. I've got an a good question here from Cindy. I attended a land governance towards a more just future. This is a conference, I believe. Understanding, understanding the, the, the land back movement today, and do you think these policies that need to be created must involve the First Nations perspective? So the question is, how do, we, how, how do First Nations issues get rolled into the climate issue? Um, you speak of the federal government being unable to give clear requirements. It's similar to their relationship with the indigenous. Uh, I heard the word reconciliation, a huge system change is needed. So clarity, like clarity with respect to the climate, but also I mean using the, the reconciliation process and indigenous issues as, a, as, a, as, a, as another example of uh, the need for, for clear policies. Thoughts, Jim? Uh, climate change is not an issue that is uh, race related yeah and therefore i don't see the the relevance it is an issue that is global in nature it is an issue that is societal in nature in a broad context mm -hmm. and it has to be dealt with the color of the skin where you were born all mm -hmm. those factors are not important in the issue i think one aspect there though cindy i think that does make sense is on the monitoring side of things so the uh, the fact that um, you know there's we had a guest speaker from Alaska actually from Anchorage with the local environmental observer in which they had data being gathered by local communities indigenous communities that had been living in the same place and on the shore and been doing the same resource management practices fishing for for hundreds and hundreds of years so having them involved in the process of of monitoring and looking at kind of subtle changes that most people like a lot of people 
would not see just because of the, the consistency of them being in the place. I think there's a lot of room for, um, for incorporating different forms of knowledge from those that have been living in certain places for extended periods of time. In the Arctic, for instance, um, there is, I think that's, that's, uh, that's an issue. But um, the other side of that I think is something we need to consider is vulnerability. So on the adaptation of side of climate change, there are groups that would have a disproportionate amount of vulnerability, much like COVID, uh, but in the case of like, people that have been relying on um, a sustenance fishing, right? Indigenous communities that have been hunting, uh, fishing and so forth that have seen changes, markedly, market, marked changes over the last 10, 15 years to their capability to sustain themselves. That can be seen, I think, as a, as a vulnerability issue in the adaptation side of climate change. Um, but in terms of overall emissions reductions, I mean, that again, this is a this is a macro problem, like uh, if we're talking about the government in Canada as a, as a, as a nation. Yes. Um, so we've got a couple more questions. You've really like lit them up, Jim, I'm telling you. Um, <laughs> Caitlin, uh, it appears to be about a sense of urgency, true. It's true that we've shown agility as possible, correct? I think that we can see a pretty clear connection between colonial colonialism and the acceleration of climate change. Um, Jim, you wanna take that on? colonialism yeah i'm not sure where that's coming from yeah i don't yeah. get that uh if you talked about the industrial revolution yes yeah i could go along with that one but colonialism no i don't see the relationship i may be just missing something but certainly industrialization yeah the industrial revolution where we we move to all our carbon-based uh, fuels mm -hmm. that's a big one yeah, and you can you can, can, you can, you can, you can plot the CO2 issue from there. Yeah, you could you can connect them in the sense that I mean colonialism uh, and in the industrial revolution uh, was you know fueled by economic development, which in some in, in many cases in the UK was uh, fueled in part by colonialism, like going to find foreign markets for materials and so forth. Um, there, I mean, you can you can look at the relationship there, but in just purely based on the emissions of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. I mean, that's, it's the trajectory of industrial development, like yep. uh, the discovery of fossil fuels and a means by which we can, you know, generate power to do all kinds of different things has driven uh, that curve. That's right. That's where your, your issue is, whether, yeah, whether you had colonialism or colonialization or not, you would have had different countries wanting to, to sell different things. It didn't matter what form of government it was in. It was the Industrial Revolution that pushed it. So we've got a uh, Mary, we need a Dr. Fauci of environmental issues endorsed by the federal government to come out and inform every day the public about the risks of climate change. Fair point. We need like an uh, like a, a scientific officer or someone like that I mean, who would that be in the Canadian government? Would that be like the, uh, like the uh, I guess we have in the office of the uh, Ombudsman, we have the Sustainable Development Office right now. I guess technically well, they're, they're responsible for doing the audits of the government to, to see whether or not we're like sustainable or not, but they don't deal with the public as much. Well, we've, we've had that and it hasn't achieved anything. We have the science advisor to the, the federal government that hasn't been listened to very much. Uh, We've we've got it with with regard to COVID simply because of the the direct impact in the short term we're we're dealing with. I mean, we're dealing with much longer term problems. Um, look how many times the government even listens to the budget officer. You know, we've had the we've had a number of central attempts. It really gets back down to the the issue of whether the people who are elected to go to government and the government system we currently have which is unfortunately mm -hmm. focused on the on the privy on the uh, prime minister's office rather than on the cabinet mm -hmm. as long as we have a system like this and we don't have statesmen up there pushing the issue we're going to have a hard time well because there's just so many pieces yeah and currently as you as you know jim i didn't want to get too far into it but i mean the the, the decisions that are coming out of ottawa like the changes that you're saying that need to happen right now if you want a strategic and an overarching approach to address this currently would need to come from the pmo that's the way things are working right now and it doesn't right. appear that, it does not appear that they're going to come from the pmo currently that's my opinion you don't have people who have 
you know, have a lot of young people who are interested in politics and uh, you don't have any states people in the statesmen in the whole thing. Yeah. And it's not going to come out of the PMO now. No. I mean, if you had a loaded cabinet that were empowered and then coordinated by the PMO and listened to, and that was kind of like a, a flat management structure, then maybe, I don't know, but yeah. I, it doesn't look like that's the way things are working. And from what I understand, it's not the way things are working right now. Yeah, that's my understanding too. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> and that's why we probably had the, the best environmental regulations coming out of a progressive conservative government, not out of a liberal government. Well, yeah, no, and that's just what I say. Like when I taught environmental impact assessment, the uh, the most green, the greenest prime minister in recent Canadian history, let's say in the last fifty years, recent, Brian Mulroney. Like uh, absolutely, I was there when he was there, and it was definite. Uh, when you get the leadership, it happens. Yeah, and not exactly the guy that you want to go and. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, was disliked by many people, uh, but you know, you don't always have to be liked to get the job done. I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and in fact, the acid rain issue was greatly facilitated through his relationship with Reagan at the time, as I understand it. Right? They became yes. these buddies. Anyway, it was. It's a history lesson for tonight. But we're pushing an hour and a half, Jim. Holy cow! Can't believe it. Not surprising. I knew when we get going, the gloves would come off and we just start going. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. But I wanna I wanna thank you very much for uh, for participating. We do this virtually right now because I know when you used to do this with our guests who came in, you'd give them the Royal Roads University mug, right? Remember that? So I'm gonna have to one of these. You still got one there? Okay, there we go. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to get you some. I got you lunch next time you're in the same place and we're over the COVID stuff. How about that? The deal? That sounds good. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Really appreciate it. Uh, highly well, informative. Fun. That's the voice of experience speaking. Um, and then and this is something we need to listen to. Um, uh, everybody, thank you very much for coming out. For those that didn't make it, um, uh, spread the word. They'll be able to see it on YouTube and I'll get it up tomorrow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot, Jim. We'll be in touch yeah, soon. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Take care. <laughs>